I could ask those members who are leaving the chamber to leave, and if everyone else could resume their seats, please. Uh, we will move on to <coughs> excuse me, questions to the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Um, question number seven, which stands in my own name, um, has been withdrawn. Um, the first person I have on my list is Mr Jerry Kelly. Before I call Mr Kelly, could I welcome Minister Lyons to his first question time as dear Minister and congratulate him on his appointment. I call Mr Jerry Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, Kirsty here in question one, and I welcome the Minister in his first question time as well. Thank you, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, the member highlights the breeding populations of curlew are declining and have declined significantly in our lifetimes. There are a range of existing legislative and policy measures in place to protect them. They are fully protected under the wildlife order when they are nesting and a number of areas of special scientific uh, interest, for example, some of the islands in uh, Lower Loch Erne and Loch Ney are designated for curlew and other breeding waders. Curlew are also protected within the planning system, where advice from officials in NIA2 planning authorities is to avoid and mitigate any potential impacts to curlew, including suitable habitat they could utilise from land development and associated activities. My officials are involved in undertaking the third UK Special Protection Area Network review under the BIRDS Directive, along with the other UK nature conservation agencies. As part of this review, officials have considered protection for significant breeding curlew sites within the Northern Ireland SPA network. Sites at Lower Loch Urn and the Antrim Hills support nationally important populations of breeding curlew and have been identified as potential additions. Once advised to by my officials, I will consider proposals to protect the areas supporting uh, the remaining significant breeding curlew populations in Northern Ireland. In addition, there are a number of areas where the Department is undertaking specific actions to support them or is providing support to, do, to others to do likewise. The Caffrey Greenmount Hill Farm at Glenwary is an education, training and knowledge and technology transfer resource for students and farmers. As part of this function and in partnership with a range of stakeholders, an area of 75 hectares of wet grassland is being managed to suit the individual needs of the three targeted priority species of wading birds, curlew, snipe and lapwing. This management has, after an absence of 20 years, resulted in curlew returning to the Greenmont Hill Farm in 2016 and successfully rearing 14 chicks since then. Mr Kelly. Thank you, Mr. for his answer up to now. It was a very comprehensive one, so he may have answered some of the next question I'm going to ask. Uh, but he will be aware that from a report from the National Parks and uh, Wildlife Service that the curlew is down 96 per cent, and the worry is that they will actually be um, extinct within a decade. Uh, you have went through quite a comprehensive list of areas which are being assisted. Uh, and I presume the Minister is aware that uh, in the South, and you mentioned right across uh, Britain as well, uh, that, that there is the appointed 30 uh, officers specifically to identify sites, and you've discussed why sites have been identified. Is there any uh, movement on that or any idea from the Minister that you would be appointing more um, officers to, to research officers to check that? Uh, well, first of all, uh, it is absolutely correct that the, the curlew are, are declining, and that is uh, a cause of concern uh, for us. Um, he had highlighted the, uh, the, the numbers. Um, it is an 82 per cent decrease since 1987, and there are only 250 pairs uh, remaining. That is why we have taken the action um, that we have taken so far and have uh, ensured that NIEA um, also take into consideration um, their future whenever um, planning applications are being discussed. Uh, if more resources are, are needed, that is, of course, uh, something um, that we are happy to consider, considering the uh, perilous state uh, that, um, that we have here in front of us. Though in some good news, uh, I, I was notified that there were uh, a pair uh, down at Larn Promenade uh, in recent days. So once the uh, restrictions uh, are lifted, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I'm sure that members will want to uh, flock to Larn to, to see it for themselves. Flock, flock indeed. Um, Mr. Robbie Butler. 
Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, welcome the Minister to his uh, new role, and I know he'll do a good job in keeping the seat warm for Minister Poots. Um, Minister, a wildlife licence is required if one wants to disturb or remove protected wildlife for reasons of damage to agriculture, livestock and fisheries. How is the damage assessed and how many of these have been issued since January 2020? It's not something I'm specifically uh, aware of, um, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. However, the uh, environmental farming scheme is also in place to make sure that that help uh, is there uh, to, to make sure that these um, uh, birds can be uh, protected. But um, in regards to the specific details that he, he raises, I'm more than happy to, to come back to him in writing, and I hope that that is helpful. Mr. Mark Durkin. Question number two. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, in February 2020, we committed to Northern Ireland's continued participation in the development of a UK-wide proposal to reform the packaging producer responsibility system and the introduction of a deposit return scheme. The plan is to consult on these schemes this year. Powers are being taken in the Westminster Environment Bill to provide for a deposit return scheme for Northern Ireland alongside England and Wales. Such a scheme can significantly increase recycling and the recyclability of single-use drinks containers. A deposit return scheme can also result in a substantial reduction in the amount of littering in Northern Ireland. Other countries, such as Germany, Norway and the Netherlands, for example, have achieved collection and recycling rates of 98%, 97% and 95% respectively for plastic drinks bottles. The options for scope of material and size of container, deposit level and model of a DRS will be presented in the forthcoming consultation. Mr Durkham. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister. I'd like to wish the Minister well in his new role, and it's certainly no reflection on him when I say I hope he isn't in it for long, and sincerely wish uh, Edmund Poots a full and swift recovery. As Health Minister, uh, Edwin Poots did recognise the value of cross-border north-south collaboration. Is uh, the Minister aware of any discussions that have taken place with the Irish Government on the coordination of a deposit return scheme across the island? Well, first of all, um, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I thank the member for his uh, kind words, and I, I don't intend to be here uh, too much longer either. And I can I can assure him I will I will leave with with grace whenever uh, the time comes, and uh, I'll not be uh, inciting crowds to attack Dundonald House uh, in the hope that I can uh, stay on uh, any longer. Uh, the, 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 the member um, makes specific uh, reference to um, the cooperation that has existed with the uh, Republic of Ireland. Um, it is not intended that we take forward scheme on an island-wide basis, and that's for, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, um, it's the, the, why, the reason why we're doing a UK-wide scheme is because it will be consistent with the packaging um, that is going to be uh, in place. There's also the issue of waste collection, uh, which is different in the Republic of Ireland, managed more by private firms, uh, whereas here there is a... Um, a it's the councils, obviously, that, that, that deal with that. However, my officials have met with counterparts uh, in the Republic of Ireland to discuss the schemes uh, and identify uh, any issues. Mr. Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I again would like to welcome the Minister to his post and wish uh, Edwin Poots every success in, in his recovery. Minister, this is something that is of great interest to me also. And, and I was interested in your response, and particularly the, the, the case study of Germany, who have been extremely successful in, in this um, uh, scheme particularly around a refund scheme with particular reference. But I've also known, Minister, that in speaking to the industry itself, that there's a great gap between the conversations had between departmental officials, the plastic manufacturing industry, and indeed the recyclable industry. Is there a point in which we can form, formulate whether it's a working group to ensure that we can maximise uh, on our recycling capacity in relation to single-use plastics? Yes. Um uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, obviously the, the consultation um, document that will go out will consider uh, all of these issues, but he will also be aware of the work that my um, predecessor uh, has done in relation to uh, single-use plastics. I think we're all aware um, of the damage that they can cause and um, the need that we have to increase uh, recycling rates right across the board. And uh, it's right that all of these things are taken into consideration. Mr. Allen, Chambers. 
Deputy Speaker uh, and Minister, I'd like to be associated with uh, all the good wishes to you going forward. Uh, Minister, there are so many single-use drink containers, from plastic fruit juice drinks containers to milk containers. Uh, would the Minister anticipate that the full range of these cartons will be included in any possible uh, future scheme? Uh, well, yes, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and that will all be part of the consultation uh, moving forward. From I think, from everybody's point of view, if we're going to introduce such a scheme, it will be helpful for that to be as wide uh, as possible, so that we can get to where we want to be uh, in terms of achieving maximum uh, recycling rates. Mr. Philip McWigan. Very good. Pre your last can call you, and I, I, I welcome uh, the minister's comments, uh, and would obviously welcome a deposit return scheme. Given the current climate and environmental crisis we are currently in, Minister, though uh, you may well be aware that I have tabled a private member's bill on single-use plastics, uh, I mean, and I would certainly welcome uh, the Minister's view and support on a total ban on single-use plastics. So, um First of all, um, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I think it is worth noting that the um, Northern Ireland Civil Service, led by uh, DERA, are presently implementing a plastic reduction action plan uh, to end unnecessary single-use plastic uh, across um, the Northern Ireland Civil Service government estate. And DERA is on track to achieve this um, by the target date of October 2021. And suppliers are presently identifying alternatives to the disposable items currently in use and a staff awareness campaign uh, across all the departments has commenced. I think it is uh, important. I think people want to see uh, that leadership. In, in relation to further uh, legislation on this issue, my predecessor advised the Assembly in November that he had asked DERA to look at introducing restrictions on uh, nine common uh, single-use plastic items along the lines of bans proposed elsewhere in the UK. And to meet the new decade, new approach commitment to tackle plastic pollution, and we will propose uh, further measures to control plastic waste, including legislation on plastic caps and lids, labelling, recycled content, and reductions in single-use plastic cups and food containers. Ms. Claire Bailey. Question just answered, Mr. Speaker. But thank you very much. <laughs> Grand, Mr. John Blair. Also answered, Principal Deputy Excellent. The Minister is on a roll. Dr. Steve Aiken. Question number three, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, my department has carried out uh, extensive work in this area, including the realignment of operational processes in support of a small but important number of businesses depending on uh, product movements with other parts of the UK. This trade includes live fish uh, and fish over for trout farming, the supply of ornamental fish for trade in pet shops and garden centres, and the long-established eel fishery in Loch Ness. Trout farming depends on the movement of live ova. Northern Ireland has a positive disease-free status, allowing exports from specialist producers locally to different producers uh, across the world. My department is able to provide disease-free certification of locally produced fish to enable uh, these exports with the process depending on the requirements of the receiving country. My department is able to provide certification to allow movement to the EU uh, as there is access to the relevant processes and databases. Whilst locally we receive relatively small consignments moving in the opposite direction, we are able to authorise inward movements which meet healthy fish requirements and are accompanied by adequate health certification. In the case of inward movements from GB, consignments are inspected at the point of entry. Ornamental fish are largely an Asian product, which is initially imported to GB and onward consignments arrive for trade locally and further transport into the Republic of Ireland. Uh, cl clearly, processes uh, need to be revised, given the point of entry to uh, the EU regulatory zone. Um, my officials uh, from Veterinary Science and Fisheries Inspectorate have engaged uh, with colleagues in DEFRA, uh, the Centre for Environment, Fisheries and Aquaculture Sciences, and the Animal, Plant and Health Agency to develop a process which facilitates trade whilst mitigating for fish health and welfare issues as a result of the increased uh, inspections required. Dr. Aiken. Indeed, may I thank the Minister and welcome the Minister to his position. Uh, not so long ago in this very Assembly, the Minister was standing in for Minister Poots beforehand, and we had a question about aquaculture, and particularly the issues to do with importation of fish, and it was coming in. 
And the Minister at that uh, uh, meeting then stated that there were no issues to be concerned about. Would the Minister be aware of the concerns that the eel fisheries currently have with the importation of elvers to restock Loch Ness, and the implications that of not being able to import them from the River Severn are going to have a significant effect on the eel fisheries going forward? Uh, yes, um, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I think we're all aware of the challenges um, for, for eels at this moment uh, in time, as trade in eels in and out of the EU has been prohibited uh, by the EU scientific uh, review group since 2010, and that prevents the trade of eels from Northern Ireland to Great Britain and Great Britain uh, to Northern Ireland. Uh, I find these requirements unnecessary, and the movement of eels from Great Britain poses no risk to Northern Ireland. It is, in fact, um, not necessary uh, and completely unacceptable. Mr. Matthew O'Toole. Principal Deputy Speaker, it, it is worth noting as we consider these matters that 80 per cent of the market for Loch Ness eels is in the European Union. And on that note, um, Minister, uh, sadly, food producers in Great Britain are finding themselves shut out of the European market. Whether it's Somerset cheddar, Scottish longestines or Welsh lamb, they're struggling to get it into continental Europe and sadly, it's really, really hurting their business. But the good news is we have replacement products for all of those things in Northern Ireland. Minister, what is your department doing to maximise opportunities for our food producers to replace those that sadly from Great Britain are lost out under the protocol we have unfettered access that they don't have? So what is your department doing to maximise those benefits? Well, of course, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, he mentions that 80% can go into the EU, but I'm concerned about the 20% that goes into to Great Britain. I don't want us to cut off um, from, from that market. I want that to be there, which is why, instead of trying to uh, find alternative markets, which we should always be trying to do, I want to make sure that our biggest market is there and that we can continue to trade into. Mr. Jim Allister. I wouldn't want to be as slippy as an eel in answering this question. Uh, but can I ask him, could he update the House, what is the position as of now in relation to DEFRA inspectors under the protocol at our ports, and does he commit as a unionist that he will play no part in aiding the partitioning of this United Kingdom and therefore will not be putting officials back into those ports? Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, uh, it's currently the case that the Department have received the threat assessment from the PSNI, and that is currently being considered by the Department along with the, our own risk assessment and potential mitigations uh, that can be put in place. Uh, I do not want those uh, uh, checks to have to take place. I want to see free, unfettered trade between Great Britain uh, and Northern Ireland. Those staff have currently been taken out as a result of the threats that were made and on a safety uh, issue, but I want to make sure that we can find a political solution to the problems that we currently face. I know that's what the member had said last week uh, in the Assembly as well on the matter of the day, that there is no excuse whatsoever uh, for these threats, and I hope that he would join me in wanting to find a political solution to the problems that we face and not keep people out on the basis of threats. Mr John Blair. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, thank you. Going matter, back to the matter of, of aquaculture, can I ask, and I, I welcome the Minister, uh, like others, to, to his first year of question time, can I ask what steps the Department is taking to restore uh, marine uh, ecosystems? And for example, would the Minister consider implementing a similar scheme to that done in uh, UK with the 500 million Blue Planet Fund? Um, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I currently don't have um, any additional information on the issue that the member raises. But of course, we all understand the importance of our uh, marine um, uh, wildlife and the importance to support that where can and where we can. And if there are specific measures in particular that he wants me to raise, I'm more than happy to consider them. Ms. Claire Bailey. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I'd like to ask the Minister, at a recent committee meeting, we were informed that up to 80 per cent of um, our own baby eels from the lock are removed for stocking eel fishery farming. Um, I was wondering what the Department or his thoughts are on that um, decline of 80 per cent and what we're doing to address that. And it, is it sustainable? Thank you. Well, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, that has not been highlighted to me uh, as an issue uh, at this moment in time. Um, so I can only assume that that is done in a, in a sustainable uh, way. But of course, I can uh, find more information uh, for the for the member on that. 
Mr. Stuart Dixon. Welcome, Minister, to your, your first question time. Question number four. Thank the member and thank you, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I am aware, of course, of the additional requirements being placed on local businesses in relation to the import of organic products from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. Uh, I oppose uh, these restrictions within the UK internal market, especially if the product is retained for use within the UK. These restrictions cause economic harm to Northern Ireland business. Northern Ireland is required to adhere to, UK, to EU rules and regulations for organic pro, uh, products uh, as a result of the Northern Ireland Protocol under UK domestic law. And while the EU has recognised GB organic standards as equivalent, organic certificate of inspection checks are required for organic produce that is imported from GB for businesses that produce, prepare, store, import or sell organic products. My officials have been working closely with their counterparts in DEFRA with the aim of alleviating the difficulties that are arising from these additional checks and administration. I will also be writing to Michael Gove and George Eustace to raise these issues and seek a timely, pragmatic resolution. Mr. Dixon. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for, for, for your answer. I'm, I'm encouraged by the work which you're doing, uh, and indeed the comments which you've just made with regards to uh, seeking out uh, uh, political solutions uh, to the difficulties that we face in relation to the import and export of goods from Northern Ireland. But of course, you, Minister, along with your predecessor, also have a statutory duty to perform your functions. Uh, I'm sure you would not wish to be in breach of the ministerial code by either dragging your feet or working against them. I'm not quite sure if there was a question in there, um, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, but um, it's absolutely correct. I'm, I'm not dragging my feet on anything. Mrs. Rosemary Barton. Minister, can I also welcome you to question time and wish uh, Mr. Poots all the best in his recovery? Minister, is there any uh, progress in, rem in the removing the barriers that are bringing in pedigree breeding cattle and sheep into Northern Ireland from Great Britain? This has been a problem. Yes, um, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I am aware of this. It's, it's another, uh, yet another problem associated with the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, discussions are going on between uh, my department and other relevant departments in um, the UK government. Um, it's unacceptable some of the changes that have taken place, and uh, it's frustrating not only from from a trade point of view and a constitutional uh, point of view, but some of them are just are, are just absurd and unnecessary, and that's why we need to see change. Mr. Melissa McHugh. Uh, I think that's question five, um, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. My department has made one further bid of £9 million following the Minister of Finance's recent statement that significant COVID funds are available. Uh, this funding will be used to support the creation of a reserve in the Forest Service. I continue to explore all options. Um, however, in scoping additional spend within the department and other organisations, delivering spend by the 31st of March is extremely difficult within the parameters set out by the Department of, of Finance. And this is a major issue in making additional bids given the risk of not spending. It should also be noted that earlier this year the Executive agreed an allocation of £25 million uh, to DERA for market interventions in the agri-food sector. This was the most comprehensive allocation made by any UK or EU administration across the agriculture and horticulture sectors during the coronavirus emergency. It was based on a very strong economic rationale for providing financial assistance to agricultural and horticultural businesses to enable them to deal with short-term disruptions that would substantially impact on otherwise viable businesses. And my department is now focused on ensuring that this is fully spent in this financial year. Mr. McHugh. Uh, Minister, uh, thank you for your answer. And again, too, like others, can I welcome you to your elevated post uh, uh, now as the Minister of Agriculture. Uh, and again, too, I'd like to also wish Mr. Poots a very speedy recovery. Uh, Minister, just on Friday of the week past, I was contacted by a third level rural student. Um, and that person has spent nine hours attempting to. Uh, uploading an assignment 
uh, as a result of very, very poor broadband connectivity. And in that same household, uh, there's also an A-level student and a GCSE student all attempting to use the same facility that is totally and absolutely inadequate to meet their needs uh, in relation to education and so on. So, Minister, I ask you, uh, uh, can you consider, we'll say, providing an additional scheme uh, for rural dwellers uh, defined by the, by the Rural Needs Act uh, in order to uh, either provide them with devices and or an improvement in broadband? Well, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, if there is an issue in regards to advice, devices for educational purposes, I think that that would fall under uh, the Department of uh, Education. I am constrained insofar as the um, money that is uh, spent, the money that is allocated, uh, has to go towards um, losses that have been incurred as a result of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, along with taking into consideration the, the tight time scales uh, that now exist. If there are particular measures um, that any member wants my department um, to, to look at, I'll be more than happy uh, to do that, but we obviously do work uh, within those uh, constraints. That being said, I am glad that we have been able to provide uh, so much support, as I said in my opening answer, more than in any other part of the, of the UK or the European Union. I hope that that goes some way to helping those that have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Patsy McLone. Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and welcome yourself to Minister. And I, I do wish uh, Edwin well in his uh, speedy recovery and indeed to, to be back at his desk too. Uh, Minister, just in regard to the overall finance, um, we know Westminster has refused to step in to replace the 15.3 million EU ring fenced TB eradication monies, and also there is the question of the 34 million assigned previously, uh, or the disparity, the uh, reduction in monies for £34 million for rural development funds, which of course is pivotal and crucial to many of the rural areas that we represent. That is over the next three years. Um, is the Minister in a position to advise as to what efforts have been made by the Department to replace those monies, please? Well, I know it is the case um, that my predecessor had worked with other colleagues in other devolved administrations, writing to the UK Government, making them aware of their concerns um, in relation to the issues that the member uh, has raised. I am more than happy to keep the member updated as we get more information in relation uh, to that. That ends the period for listed questions. Uh, we now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. and I call Ms Carol McKillum. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. I welcome Gordon to his post and wish Edmund all the best in his recovery. Regarding the temporary suspension of checks on products of animal origin at both Belfast and Larn ports as a result of alleged threats and intimidation of staff, can the Minister provide an update, um, if he has it, on the PSNI's assessment of the situation as it currently is? Uh, yes, um, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, um, the Department received uh, that updated threat assessment uh, towards the end of uh, last week. As the Permanent Secretary set out in his evidence to the uh, ERA Committee on uh, Thursday, I think it was, he said that following uh, that threat assessment there would be further engagement with staff uh, and trade unions and that they would also finalise um, the risk uh, assessment in line with the Department's responsibilities under health and safety uh, legislation, as well as finding potential mitigations. Ms. Um, I thank uh, the Minister for his response. And would he agree with me um, that it is um, completely unacceptable that vital public services that are going to impact not just on people, but certainly even the industry, should not be withdrawn? As a result of intimidation um, and criminal action, and could he ensure that this issue is kept up to date? And any information regarding these threats last week is shared not only with the committee but indeed with this house. Well, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I think it's important that we put on record that um, threats are wrong. Threats are always wrong, 
and uh, nobody should be stopped from going to their place of work. Uh, unfortunately, um, these threats uh, were all too common in the past as well. In, in the last 30 or, or 40 years, people uh, were threatened from going about and doing their own job. It was wrong then, uh, and it is wrong uh, now. I think it is important that we take precautions uh, and that we put the safety and well-being of our staff uh, first and, and foremost, and that is what we have done. Mr. John O'Dowd. Minister, uh, despite the PSNI's assessment that there are were no credible threats, you as Minister keep referring to these threats. The fact of the matter is that the information given to this Assembly and to Middle and East Antrim Council was based on half-truths, misinformation and erroneous information. Uh, workers were used as pawns in a very, very cruel game. When will you as Minister carry out your duties and ensure these services are restored? Well, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I can assure the member and the House that I am carrying out uh, my duties. Um, that has absolutely always uh, been the case. The safety of staff has always been what is first and foremost in my mind, and it would be wrong to say anything else other than that. Uh, we have put in place a clear process. Uh, there were concerns. There were threats. Um, that was well. The, 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 the graffiti that was put up was very was very much taken uh, as a threat. There were a number of concerns that were expressed, and it was only right uh, that we took precautionary measures and make sure that there are additional mitigations uh, in place. And I don't see the problem uh, with wanting to make sure that the full threat assessment was done, making sure that we do our own uh, risk assessment, uh, and making sure that any mitigations that need to be put in place are put in place. Mr. O'Dowd. I have no problem with anyone ensuring the safety of their workers, but my concern is this, that the fact that there is no credible threat which has been stated by the PSNI, and the fact that the, the, a leg at halfway around the world before the truth got its pants on, that that agenda of those workers being removed suits your political agenda. And rather than dealing with the facts, Minister, you are allowing these non-existent threats to carry forward a political agenda which would be contrary to your statutory duty and the code of, you have as a minister. It's absolutely disgraceful because throughout I have been very, very clear in the comments that I made when I was in this chamber last week to the comments that were made by the Permanent Secretary and to the answers that I have given now. I think I have very clearly demonstrated that staff safety is what is coming first, first of all, and secondly, that we had a process that was put in place. It is not a process that I have uh, been interfering with. We have let that run uh, its course. There have been discussions ongoing with the PSNI. There have been discussions and will be discussions with trade unions and other staff. And I find that an entirely appropriate response to what has gone on. Dr. Steve Aiken. Very much indeed. And uh, may I ask the minister, his predecessor expressed his concerns about ARC 21 and incineration. And would the current minister, would he continue to express his concerns about ARC 21 and incineration, particularly in relation to the completely unneeded high town incinerator? Uh, well, um, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, this is not something that I have yet uh, received a, a briefing on or have had any conversation with the previous minister in relation to. And I am more than happy to consider all the facts, to consider the evidence, to consider, consider the need, uh, if any. And then if there are decisions that I need to make in relation to that, uh, I, of course, uh, will make those based on all the evidence that is there. Dr. Aiken. For his comments so far. Would the Minister therefore like to join with me and indeed other members from South Antrim to have discussions with No Arc 21 so he can further inform himself of some of the really serious issues that are involved with this as well? And we'd be delighted to facilitate that with the Minister. Well, Deputy Speaker, I, I do not know how much longer I will, I will be in place, but as with all invitations, I'm, I'm more than happy to consider them uh, as they come in. Mr. Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. And, uh, I also welcome you to your post, and I hope that Edmund makes a speedy recovery as well. And, Minister, not, not to labour the fact that some other people here have asked, or other MLAs have asked the questions uh, about. I was looking really 
a risk assessment or an update from your department from the PSNI on the alleged threats against the dearest staff, both at Belfast and at Larne, taking in mind, I come from an arm myself, that the first thing we put up when any attack happened on our business was open for business, business as normal, and that's the signs we want to see back up again in the Port Minister. Uh, I thank the member for his question, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And by way of update, I hope I have set that out that the threat assessment was received. Uh, officials are then having further engagement with staff and trade unions. Um, we will finalise a risk assessment in line with the department's responsibilities under health and safety legislation, and then ensure that whatever mitigations are necessary are put in place. Uh, Minister, yes, I hear what you say. There are many in this house and beyond our concern that the, your predecessor took action which was not proportionate with the security advice received from the PSNI. Can you confirm that, in line with the police assessment, that staff will return to work to undertake their important roles, minimising the disruption caused by Brexit? Well, um, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I think that the Permanent Secretary set out quite clearly the process uh, and what took place in. Um, the uh, days or hours leading up to the decision uh, that was taken. Um, I'm not going to be bound by any time scale. Um, I'm going to let the, the process that we set out at the start uh, take its place, and I think that's entirely appropriate. Mr. Robin Newton. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I join with other members uh, in congratulating the, the new minister, and indeed join with others in? Uh, uh, wishing Mr. Poots a very speedy recovery. Can I ask the, the Minister? Um, the Minister would be aware that uh, puppy smuggling is a significant uh, activity in Northern Ireland, uh, from the Republic into Northern Ireland, from Northern Ireland into to Scotland. Can I ask the Minister what steps he is taking to address the issue? Can I thank the member for, for raising this issue, not only now, but the concern that he has shown um, for this um, for, for, for quite some time. And um, Operators of puppy farms aim to get maximum profit uh, for minimum effort, and they do not care about the living conditions or indeed the welfare uh, of their dogs. And I am also aware that the sale of these dogs sometimes involves travel uh, through Northern Ireland ports. Uh, my department has recently established a multi-agency forum to tackle puppy smuggling. The forum has met twice in the last two months and contains representatives from my department, councils, PSNI and Harbour Police. In addition, my department continues to carry out checks at ports in Northern Ireland to ensure that dogs being moved through ports have the relevant paperwork and are in compliance with welfare and transport regulations. The department's website and the NI Direct website contain a range of information on buying and caring for a puppy, including um, a, a guide that goes along with that. Mr. Newton. I thank the Minister. That, that is indeed good news, uh, and I am absolutely certain that that will be welcomed by all those involved in the care of pups. Minister, there is another step that I think does need to be taken, uh, and particularly in the uh, health situation that we are in, where it has been extremely popular to buy a pup. And indeed, I, I, I expect that you might agree with me, Minister, that there is a need to educate the public in how they might a, go about buying a, a pup, who they would be buying the pup from, and indeed the aftercare of the pup should it take ill and the source of who they have bought the pup from and the responsibilities of that source. Um, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I entirely agree with what the member has said. I already had uh, set out about the um, buying and caring for a puppy guide that Dara has uh, produced, and uh, this guide sets out advice on finding a responsible breeder um, or, or seller. And it was supplied to the Northern Ireland Education Authority in 2018 for placing in its teaching resources library uh, for the use uh, of teaching staff. And I hope that that is being used. And I would encourage. Um, the member to get in contact with schools in his constituency um, so that they can be aware um, that that resource is available. And uh, I think it's absolutely right um, that it's not just trying to prevent problems um, from, from happening, but make, uh, to stop problems from happening, but trying to prevent them in the first place. That's, that's the most important thing, and I appreciate him raising that issue of education. Mr. Jonathan Buckley. Well, Deputy Speaker, um, the Minister may know that for a number of weeks ago, 
I highlighted an issue on the Loch Ness in relation to dangerous activity via videos, uh, which put life at risk uh, from bailiffs operating under the remit of the Fishermen's Cooperative. Could the Minister confirm that his department is taking this serious and that those issues will be investigated? Uh, I thank the member for uh, raising this issue, and um, I believe he also uh, wrote to me uh, in relation to this. And I think it's absolutely right where those concerns are expressed and where uh, issues such as he describes are taking place, uh, that those are fully investigated. And um, I, I, it is my understanding that one of my um, uh, officials had been made uh, aware. Uh, of that and had engaged in conversations with those who are involved, and I'm more than happy to keep the member updated as to the outcome of those discussions. Mr. Buckley. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, there is a long litany of concerns in relation to the activity on Loch Ness by the Fishermen's Cooperative, so I would appreciate if the, if the Minister and via his department officials could keep me and other members informed as to those ongoing investigations as they develop. Thank you. Well, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, the member has um, very much put this on the, the record. Uh, it's something my officials will, will take a note of, and we will, we will keep him uh, updated. Thank you. Thank you, members. That concludes question time to the Minister for Agriculture. We will shortly return to the debate on the health protection regulations, when the next person to speak will be Ms. Cara Hunter. Can I invite members to take their ease until then. Thank you.